Welcome back to another episode of the Good Question Podcast by Coin Schedule TV. In today's episode of Good Question, I sat down with Will Harborn, Director of Operations at SNX. Will used to work for IBM on their closed blockchain platform, Hyperledger, then moved from there to Bitfinex and from Bitfinex onto SNX. The central theme for this podcast is decentralized exchanges and their future role in the crypto sphere. We also dive deep into the pros and cons of centralized and decentralized exchanges with respect to anonymity, hack resilience, regulation, and much more. This episode of Good Question is sponsored by Wolfpack Bot. To find out more about this ICO, go to wolfpackbot.com. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this episode. I hope you enjoy. How did you get into crypto originally? So I got involved around 2013, just trading Bitcoin, um, and I wasn't completely blown away. I thought it was interesting and um, you know something I wanted to learn a lot about, but I wasn't spending my whole time involved with it. I was still at university at the time, uh, and it was only then at the start of the Ethereum, well, when the Ethereum crowd sale started to get publicized and the white paper was out, that I really started to look much more heavily into into blockchain um, and Ethereum was the one that really kind of drew me in. What about Ethereum drew you in? It was the fact that not ju- not only was this digital money that was censorship resistant, not owned by governments, but it was that you could build all sorts of applications that used programmable money was the, uh, and I think my view on it has matured a lot since, but the fact that, you know, that could have applications in all sorts of other spaces other than just money um, was what got me really excited that this could actually be something that disrupts all sorts of monopolies, all sorts of power structures for our society. And suddenly I thought, okay, I can see how this could be really revolutionary. Mm, I agree. And the beauty is that when most power structures are taken down, they're replaced by other power structures. But in my opinion, this is the first time that power structure will be taken down, replaced by a, a, a a flat power structure in a sense potentially potentially I I think we're very willing in this space to believe or see that although there's some evidence already I think that there's starting to be other power structures already you know miners or even just very large holders of crypto and people can be a bit willing to look away from that you know even in the in our space where it's a bit um you know it's it's sometimes there's a bit of cognitive dissonance in the fact that actually things are still controlled sometimes by small groups of people mm. in crypto. But how do, we go, how do we go beyond that? How do we res- resolve those problems? Well, I think one of the major areas that's really clear, for example, is um, exchanges do hold a lot of power. Mm, that's really um, true. And, you know, I, I, I myself, like a couple of years ago when I was trading, um, could see that you know someone like uh, some of the major exchanges were taking up ar- quite arbitrary decisions, but which had huge impacts on the on the communities of traders who were using them. And instantly, there's that feeling that that's a, that's an issue that's at odds with what this whole industry is trying to trying to achieve. And so, I think a lot of the movements, like for example Aragon um, and a lot of other projects who are working on decentralized autonomous organizations, um, where customers of products begin to actually have control Mm. are sort of the answer to this and I think blockchain does enable that but it's still you know a generation later when we'll start to see that really emerge so it's not just decentralizing the technology but also the control of over that technology over how it's run over how it's managed Mm. so what do you think were the biggest problems with centralized exchanges I mean I think centralized exchanges are essential right now we have an alternative it's the only way into the ecosystem if you even want to be part of it realistically um of course i think the thing that people talk about the most is hacks to centralized exchanges um you know they are one of the largest targets now in the world with huge amounts of money secured in in wallets um and ultimately you don't have control yourself over your own funds so even at a, at a lower level than hacks, which I think are becoming, will become rarer as the standard of this industry becomes more mature. But even at the, at the point where you try to withdraw cryptocurrencies, you may face delays, there may be all sorts of checks and balances, particularly most exchanges now are bringing in very high levels of AML and KYC requirements and are going to be pressured more and more to do so by regulators and governments, which will bring us back to a scenario which is much more similar to 
the banking that we all know and hate today mm. um, in most Western democracies, and even more, um, you know, mean that we ha- we don't any longer have control even of our cryptocurrencies if we're using centralized exchanges. So I think it's really all about. I mean, the, the biggest problem is that we don't have control, and it's also going to become more and more about control of our personal data. So. Mm as you have to go through AML, KYC just to access your own cryptocurrencies through exchanges, um, that, again, means that we're, lose- we're giving away lots about our identity, which isn't necessarily going to be kept safe, isn't necessarily going to be um, used in ways that we want. I agree with all of that. Do you, could you name the centralized exchange that you think is the industry standard that other centralized exchanges should aspire to be like? I think it's... It's quite a tough question because there's such a spectrum. I yeah, mean, sure. we really have. Um, I, I think, and I, and I think actually, it's it's a, it, although it's a spectrum, most exchanges are doing the same thing. Um, personally, having worked at Bitfinex and now um, at Ethfinex, I do think that the approach there is very much a middle ground, which is that in order to access fiat banking, for example, to deposit and withdraw cryptocurrencies. You do need to go through AML KYC, of course, to access the traditional banking system. But if you want to deposit Bitcoin and sell them for Ether, you don't need to go through those checks. Mm. And you have very fast access to your your funds. Um, but even then, I think often you know you, you're you're still reliant on Bitfinex being being up, for example, um, not having downtime. Um, and I think that's the same with with most other exchanges. Mm. all other exchanges really. all other exchanges and so Ethernex uh, as you say is a halfway house between decentralization and centralization is the ultimate goal decentralization and if so what are the benefits and costs to having that as the desired outcome yeah so our ultimate goal from the beginning and the whole reason for um, Ethernex's inception was to become eventually fully decentralized but in in a dual sense, so not just the technology that the exchange runs on, but also the governance and ownership of that exchange should be um, belonging to our customers. So anyone who's using the exchange should have a say over what decisions we take, what technologies we launch, um, how those technologies are, are, are developed, um, ultimately with everything being open source and governed by that, that user set. Um, so the way we approach that is through a gradual process. So um, the reality is and, and was um, when we first thought about this around two years ago that although so I, I'd personally been working on some decentralized exchange concepts um, and some of them looked very promising I think that this, the most similar to what we were working on then uh, is IDEX mm-hmm. um, in terms of it being relatively I mean, it, it's been very successful, for example, um, but has, but can't achieve anything like what centralized exchanges do in terms of speed and performance. Um, and what we saw at that time was that that was that was the limit of what we could do at the time. And if we launched something like that, we still were never going to be able to compete head on with centralized exchanges. And so, what we saw as our path instead was to um, basically work with a, a, an existing large exchange and we approached Bitfinex because we'd seen some of what they'd done before in terms of being quite open to innovation um, and decentralization in, in their sort of mindset um, and wanted to launch both a centralized exchange but which linked into a decentralized exchange allowing users to basically have the choice and that's what we now have so we have Ethfinex centralized mm-hmm. where if you just want to trade very quickly probably small amounts, you're not particularly concerned um, about your security, Um, you you can go and do that. But you also have the option of using Ethernet Trustless where you connect with your own Ethereum wallet, your funds are always in in your control, but you access and can trade with people from that centralized exchange. So you get, you basically solve the issue of liquidity on decentralized exchanges, which is what people talk about as being the biggest barrier to their adoption. Um, I think what we've seen from that though is that that's probably not the biggest barrier. So user experience um, and the actual challenge of owning and having responsibility for your own funds Mm. right now is is still such a high barrier that that itself is blocking any further movement and shift towards decentralized exchanges. But in the long run, um, we intend to launch and are now getting quite 
well, I, I, it's, it's, I never want to say we're getting close because <laughs> things always take longer than you expect, but sure. intend to launch a fully decentralized exchange which can, which can replace that centralized component. And that won't and can't run um, in the simple way that IDEX or other um, Ethereum-based exchanges run with every transaction on chain. It'll run on um, basically a second layer, layer scaling solution, which can achieve much higher performance um, and solve some of the issues such as transactions being visible um, on chain, which give away people's trading strategies mm. and allow us to basically achieve everything that the centralized exchange can do um, with a cross-chain decentralized exchange. So that's where we're trying to get on, on, on the technology side. Mm. And on the community governance side, um, what we've been very careful to make sure of is that when, by the time we get to that point, we don't want it to be a company, FX, which is a company making the decisions. It should be all of our customers. So what we've done right from the beginning is that everyone who trades on FNX as it is now earns our Nectar tokens. Mm. So over time, that distribution of tokens is, um, and it's been going now for 11 months. So we've distributed these tokens for 11 months and those who have traded the most have the most tokens. And um, by the time we launch that solution, we want the distribution of those tokens to be wide enough that all of our largest traders have a stake in it and want, when that new exchange launches, to be there providing liquidity and trading there and to really grow a, bit, a community around it who will then shepherd it on as we kind of release it into the wild open source. So that's the journey that we're taking. Um, and we've already started to experiment now with the actual governance processes. So um, the listing of tokens onto FNX was done through a community vote. So anyone who has these Nectar tokens got voting rights where they could select different tokens, prioritize them onto a list which we then, um, the winners got added onto the platform. So that's um, the, the, the other side of that, of that shift. Mm. And I just want to talk about the leeward side for exchanges at the moment. So what do you think is the biggest regulatory hurdle, what do you reckon is the biggest uh, legislative hurdle for exchanges up until now? So I think up until now, it's really been all about AML, KYC. Okay. Um, so anti-money laundering regulations predominantly. Mm. And... There's been, um, I think, yeah, I think it's been clear for, for, for at least two years that exchanges basically have to um, comply with those, particularly when they're dealing with anything to do with um, U the US dollar or other uh, government-backed currencies. And um, that's unavoidable. I think that's already been accepted by most exchanges. Um, on the decentralized exchange side, it's a little bit different, we feel, mm -hmm. which is that, first of all, we don't have uh, fiat currencies on those exchanges. Mm -hmm. And so the actual risk of people laundering money in the traditional sense is um, lower. But the interesting thing, in, in addition to that, is every transaction, for example, on FNX Trustless and several other decentralized exchanges is traceable and auditable on chain. So um, the source of funds can never be obscured through trading on FNX Trustless, although you could exchange one, one token for another. Mm -hmm. It's still clear um, and there's an unbroken chain of custody, whereas when you deposit to a centralized cryptocurrency exchange, your funds get mixed in with a whole bunch of other people's, and unless a law enforcement request is sent to that exchange, a government can't figure out um, w where those funds ended up. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges also in terms of cost that exchanges have faced in the last year. So the number of those requests coming from all sorts of law enforcement agencies all over the world has skyrocketed. Mm. I think um, Kraken recently and let's say the published Kraken, um, yeah, yeah, a, a sort of press release showing this, but I think that's been exactly the same experience that every exchange has had, mm. um, which becomes a huge burden and distraction to, to running a business. Do you see any uh, homogeneity in the way that governments approach exchanges throughout the world? Um, I think there, I mean, I, I'm not myself hugely involved on that side, but mm -hmm. I think there's definitely um, some similarities. The, the biggest difference, though, is usually in terms of the proactivity. So um, often it'll be that the exchanges report suspicious activity to whoever's relevant, um, and they may not hear back for three or four months. 
Whereas in other cases, um, you, you may be approached by them instantly saying, there's stolen funds, can you try and block it now? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in terms of how seriously they're taking it and how uh, proactively there's a big difference, but the actual approach is still largely similar, with the exception of um, the US, who are really, it feels like, trying to, um, I, I think, as usual, extend their reach into um, this new industry and other countries, mm. which is not the, not the approach that is usually taken by most European states or other nations. Mm. And in the short term, of course, these repressive laws that are being put in place are, are stifling development, but then it is also inspiring development and push towards decentralization, surely. I, well, I think that's both yeah, a, um, an opportunity and a risk. So um, it's clear already, I think, that most of the people who are trading, many of the people who are trading now are quite resistant to the idea of handing over their personal information, even if they have no reason to actually want to hide it. Um, and that's an underlying theme of people who, who love this industry. And so one of the risks is that as you know, large centralized exchanges who are forced to comply with um, regulations which may be not, not well designed for this industry, it forces people to choose other alternatives. And there will always be something which is more decentralized. Um, so of course you can you know, stop most large uh, funds trading on centralized exchanges unless they comply. But there will always be available for people um, you know, a completely decentralized exchange. For the moment, they may be um, low liquidity, it may not be a great user experience, but that's gonna get better and better. And the risk for, I think, regulators is that if they push too hard in the wrong direction without thinking about it carefully, they're going to alienate customers and drive them towards those solutions, which may actually also mean that they're not as well protected. Um, there's no recourse um, of anyone to go to if you need, um, or if, if there is a, a fraud going on. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely um, happening, I think. And do you see a world where there is only decentralized exchanges in the crypto world, or do you see a world in which the centralized play a role and can work in harmony with decentralized? I would find it very, very unlikely that we'll ever see only decentralized exchanges. Okay. Um, and we're definitely planning for the future where both will exist and serve different customer bases. Mm. Already, we see a really clear distinction having launched Ethernex Trustless with the kind of users who it attracts. Mm-hmm. So particularly... Um, the, the, the traders who we see using Ethernex Trustless, which isn't itself a completely fully decentralized exchange, but gives the same experience where um, you're always in control. It attracts m- many small traders who don't want to go through the burden of onboarding onto a centralized exchange, but it also attracts large traders who are doing arbitrage. So particularly, they, they value the fact that they're in control because it means they have more reliability and speed when moving their funds. So rather than requesting a withdrawal from a centralized exchange, mm. which could take could take ten minutes, but it could take an hour, depending on you could, know could never happen. They how, might not have the yeah. have the liquidity to give them the. In in some cases, yeah, um, yeah but it, it it could be for any reason it could be blocked. It could be delayed. Whereas on Trustless, they always know that once that trade is made on chain, they have the funds and they can instantly move them elsewhere and sell them. Mm. So that gives them. I mean, the monetary value of that um, certainty and control is, is really high. And that's something which we see happening even more as decentralized exchanges become more popular and, and, and higher performance. So, for example, further down the line, when we have our fully decentralized exchange launched, we see that for many customers, the actual um, direct access into that decentralized exchange may not be preferable. So they may want to use an intermediate party who gives them the experience of a centralized exchange, mm. but with the underlying settlements happening through this decentralized exchange um, against you know, a, a larger liquidity pool. So I think there'll always be intermediate solutions for people who don't want to take responsibility, because ultimately that's what you have to do if you want to be um, using a decentralized exchange. You have to be willing to have responsibility for your own funds. And if we, if we grow this to a much larger group of people, there will always be people who don't want that. Yeah, I agree. And it's important for mass adoption as well, because it's fine to have people who are the crypto fanatics and enthusiasts who want control over their funds, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Mm. 
uh, as Andrea says, but there's always people who are only going to put in fifty dollars, a hundred dollars at a time. There's going to be technophobes. There's going to be um, this. Well, I think a phrase that I like to use is the conventional saying is necessity is the mother of all invention. But the saying that I like to use is necessity is the mother of all adoption. And so at the moment in the West, we don't really need to use cryptocurrencies for a day-to-day -day basis because we're not suffering from hyperinflation. Our currency seems to remain at fairly stable values and maintain value over time fairly well. But when the next economic crisis happens, which I think is personally not too far away, well, that's going to cause a necessity. That means that a lot of people are going to have to move into crypto just to find somewhere to store their value whilst the rest of the currency implodes on itself. And for those people, for the mainstream, they can't go to decentralized exchange and command authority over their own private keys because they're going to lose them. You know, even an expert makes mistakes. And so I think, I think you're totally right. And something that I was, uh, I can't exactly remember the name of the movement, but there's a movement at the moment which is to get all of the exchanges, get all the usable exchanges to extract all their funds at the same, on the same day to, to find out which exchanges um, are illiquid and let them crumble and then you know, move on to the, the trustworthy exchanges. What do you think about that movement? Yeah, so I think this was pr proof of keys, is what that we're was referring it, to, keys, yeah. um, which was supposed to happen on the 3rd of January. I think the reality was a very small percentage of um, funds were moved out of any exchange, which I don't think is surprising to anyone who works in, um, in this industry. I think it's, I mean, actually, it's a fundamentally fantastic idea if we could enforce that. It, or it's an automatic audit for every centralised player in this industry. Um, the problem is that, again, I think actually there are a huge number of people who have never actually not held their funds on exchanges or mm. in centralised wallets. And so asking them to take responsibility for a day of their own funds means they have to figure out how to make a transfer, how to set up a wallet, how to move it back afterwards, <laughs> um, which sounds easy. But these are things where, I mean, honestly, actually, even having worked, having worked now for several years in blockchain space. I was shocked when we launched our decentralized exchange as an ethnic trustless um, by how big the, the barriers were. So we, we did a few user interviews in the, in the second week of launch um, with people who tried it. And so many of the questions were so basic that I was, and these are from people who we specifically targeted as already being traders on other exchanges, including our own centralized exchange. Mm. Yet yeah, they didn't understand um, what what the mining fee is in, in Ethereum, what, what gas price means. Oh, wow. um, they didn't know exactly what, what, an, what an address should look like. Um, and all these, all, these chat, all these things, which we'd assumed were just you know, the, the entry level, um, are actually then become blockers to them using this product. And I think, again, although proof of keys is a great idea, um, there need to be, we, need, we do need to find other solutions which allow people to still get the benefits of crypto but without having to take 100% responsibility if they don't want to although there'll be lots who do basically it's about offering choice rather than forcing them to take responsibility mm. I, yeah again I think it's a beautiful idea but you don't want to be the person who takes the funds out last because if you're the last person who takes the funds out there's no funds to take out and then the, you know, the whole thing goes under I think I think the idea that there are a lot of fractional reserve exchanges operating is probably um Overblown. I think it's quite unlikely, at least, that any of the major exchanges are, are doing that. Just right. also because they are extremely profitable. Um, so that even if they did it, maybe in their early days, by now they would be there. There, there would be no need. Um, but yeah, the question is, we should know that. We should. There should be a way of finding it out, which um, there isn't right now. Because mm, there's still actors that seem to be dishonest who are uh, sustaining themselves through this bear market, which is quite r remarkable. Um, hit, hit BTC, have you heard about the scandals about Hit BTC that people have been trying to withdraw funds but unable to? And John McAfee seems to be mm. the biggest enemy of Hit BTC. It's made his personal goal to take them down, make them burn. I haven't been following that too closely. Yeah, but it's just surprising that apparently these, well, obviously, because you can track it through the, you can track it through Etherscan, that people are, the exchange is moving crypto into their own personal wallets and it's being tracked and then when the people ask for their funds back they, they say that the funds are still in the wallet but you can obviously see they're not there's a lot of scandals is all I'm saying and it seems that you would have thought that by now the bear market would have weeded mm. out the dishonest actors but it seems that that isn't the case and that they might continue on for a few more years and hopefully they're not around for the next bull run but they might be able to 
to sustain. And moving on to, because uh, you're obviously heading up SNX and you want to go fully decentralized, but I'm curious of what you think about Zachary Coburn's arrest or a war, arrest warrant with the, the founder of Ether Delta because you know he wasn't directly in control of the project or at least he isn't now and he set out a decentralized project mm. decentralized exchange and you want to do exactly the same thing but an even better version with higher adoption higher liquidity do you not feel that you might be under threat so I'm not familiar with an arrest warrant but I think it was that there was a, this fine from the oh okay um, right SEC saying that he that Ether Delta had been trading unregistered securities. Yeah, that's the one. Um, so it was um, a lot less serious than a, than a warrant, but it was that uh, he was okay. forced to pay a fine, which he agreed to pay um, as as the creator of this, um, with the the implication being that he should have known um, when he launched it that it would end up being used to trade what what were considered in the U.S. as securities. Um, so it's yeah, it's a very very interesting case. Um, something that we've obviously looked at very closely. I think the the biggest difference um, that we see is that on Ether Delta, um, anyone could basically trade anything without any control over that process. Mm-hmm. So that does obviously open it up to being used to trade securities. Um, whereas what we have at the moment on Ethnex Trust us and likely in the future on um, our decentralized exchange will be that there will be controls, but it will be not by us. It'll be by the community of traders who vote on things. Mm. Um, And since they're also owners of the platform through the next token, they have an incentive to make sure that fraudulent products or things that may be illegal in certain jurisdictions to trade um, won't be traded on that platform. So for example, um, you can make sure that everything meets certain criteria before it before it gets passed on and, and is able to trade. So that openness is one is one difference. But also um, fundamentally, I, I can't I can't you know I can't say that I agree with um, with the SEC's consideration that every token is a security, mm-hmm. uh, and also that it's morally wrong for you know it may be illegal in the U.S. to trade certain products. But whether it's morally wrong to trade them elsewhere, I think I probably wouldn't agree with. Um, and so, in the in the long term, I do see that whether it's you know someone else or whoever it may be, uh, I think there will be exchanges where you can trade these ex- these products, and they won't be able to be shut down. They won't be able to be controlled. Um, and so, trying to fight that by uh, punishing the creators of open source software is not going to be an answer. Um, and really, I think there's going to be, need to be some other solution other than just you know, finding anyone who, who tries to you know, create new technology. Mm. And as, as you say, you're going to hand over the controls for this exchange over to the community. But if you release the, the exchange and it's within the SEC's rulings, but then immediately after some of, your, uh, some of your community leaders manage to onboard some securities tokens, mm. I wonder who will be held accountable with the SEC, the because if it's a community leader, it's more decentralized. But they're yeah. not, they're, I don't think they're honestly looking to serve justice. They're looking to set an example. I agree. And, and, and they have no choice except to go to someone like, or wh- whoever launches the exchange, whoever mm. creates it, because there's no one else they can exactly. go to as recourse. And by setting the example of Ether Delta, um, you know, for example, we are a known party, but there will be many others who will launch them completely anom- anonymously. Yeah. And it's completely possible to do that. So it's not a long-term solution. Um, yeah, I think it's a risk that anyone in this space faces. Um, but ultimately, I think it will be found to be wrong. And you know that that court that that um, that fine, for example, was never challenged in court. Mm. Um, but at some point, someone will someone with big, bigger pockets will be. Um, and for example, they've gone to Ether Delta and, and Zachary Coburn first because they're not gonna they're not gonna go and fight it. But there'll be many other big centralized exchanges or other wealthy, highly backed startups who launch decentralized exchanges who would be able to challenge it in court, who would be able to um, fight that and try and say that that kind of um, intimidation tactic, really, setting an example, that, that shouldn't fly. And I, don't th- and I think um, it'll be interesting to see how those go. Mm. And just out of curiosity, how far do you think we are away from a fully functional, optimized, decentralized exchange? 
or a, ver- a variety of them? Um, I think we will see many more, much more advanced decentralized exchanges launched this year. Okay. Um, it's hard to say yet, you know, wh- how much adoption those will get, because the real challenge will be getting enough liquidity on them that they start to really pick up users and overtake, or even um, be particularly usable. But in terms of technology, I think this year we will see them launch. And do you see one of the biggest um, one of the biggest dampeners for development is the amount of projects at the RAW. It's taking the top level talent from the smart contract developers and distributing mm-hmm. it over various projects when what you really want is the best minds coming together under fewer projects and having synergy in how they develop the various technologies that they're working on. I don't think so. I mean, I believe in free market economics. Sure, and I yeah. think that good projects will attract good developers from outside and inside the ecosystem. Mm. And the number of people coming in is still growing massively because there are those opportunities. So I think it's, it's good that there are lots of competitors and lots of products. That's what's going to drive you know, the, the right solutions to eventually win out. Yeah, no, I agree. But what I mean is that at the moment in 2019, there's been a lot of projects that have been disbanded because of lack Mm. of finance, poor management, whatever. And something that I'm curious about is the freeing up of the labor market surrounding top Ethereum developers. Now that they're uh, they're free agents to move around to various projects, that might be able to embolden those projects that have been able to manage manage themselves well through this bear market. And I think that might have an accelerator effect for certain projects. Definitely, yeah, I could see that happening. Good. And... So why did you guys choose to build on top of Ethereum? I mean, really, I don't think there was a there was a choice when we um, were first thinking about this. Mm. Um, it's and and still, it would be very hard to justify any other smart contract platform just because it doesn't have the same developer ecosystem. But what we were really looking at was that um, I, th- I suppose this was right at the beginning of the ICO boom on Ethereum. Um, And what it looked like was all these projects were planning to build on Ethereum, um, decentralized fund management, um, decentralized charities that collect funds in Ethereum and then have to pay out in some other currency to whoever. Um, And ultimately, none of those can actually use a centralized exchange. Mm. uh, But they they will need to be customers of exchange because they need to change currencies for another let's say there's some other application that use, has its own utility token but customers want to pay with Ethereum they need to buy that token um, so really we wanted to build something that would serve that sort of next generation of financial applications that was being built mm. um, and still I think in the short term there's not really anything else which offers that of course in the long run I think we do plan to be more agnostic um, and most of what we're building, we're building with a view that it could be translated onto another smart contract platform or many smart contract platforms mm. um, to serve those kind of applications wherever they are. But yeah, it, it was more because that's where the customers w- would be for, for the products we're building. Mm. And I know this is a controversial um, definition, but would you consider yourself an Ethereum maximalist? I wouldn't. I, I probably would have um, in the early days of Ethereum. I mean, what I had in my head was Ethereum can do everything Bitcoin can do, <laughs> yeah. but with smart contracts. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, why should Bitcoin exist? I very much don't have that opinion anymore, but it took me quite a long time to get to that stage um, where I really value Bitcoin, for example, as being um, censorship resistant and widely adopted and, and just for its simplicity being something which can actually be revolutionary in challenging um, government monopoly over currencies. And, and similarly, I think in the long run, all sorts of other smart contract platforms and other blockchains can challenge Ethereum. Um, and if they take over momentum in terms of developers and, and the, the sort of, I think it's really about the values and the ecosystem that grows around it, then it's completely possible. So um I think we're trying to be, uh, and, you know, I, I and FNX are kind of actually becoming much more agnostic and um, open, as I think an exchange really should be mm. um, in terms of, you know, it's not, not for us to pick the technology, that's what the market does, and um, we should be ready to support whatever wins, or I don't think anything will really win, there may be, um, you know, applications for lots of different uh, smart contract platforms. And how dependent do you see uh, Ethernex on the successful implementation of scaling solutions for the Ethereum blockchain? 
like serenity. <coughs> um, it would definitely improve Ethernet trustless, for example, to have faster block times, all sorts of, and more transactions per second. But what we've what we're spending most of our development resources on building isn't dependent on um, the, the the Ethereum layer scaling solutions. So we're building with the with the expectation that it will take lo- much much longer than anyone's it predicts, which it always does. Yeah. Um, and that it'll be much less much less of a change than we hope for, um, which is usually the case as well. And so we're basically designing in a way which is very pragmatic and gives our, gives us our own scaling solution without relying on the work from um, Ethereum itself. Mm. And in the worst case, we get both, and which, which will be great. Yeah, that'd be amazing. And I think we'll end it there. Well, so thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming to the office. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful office you're in. Thanks for watching.